Welcome to the 341st episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with Nate Patron, author of the book, Bring That Beat Back, How Sampling Built Hip Hop. Stay tuned for the interview. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. Listen to audiobooks during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. Reading and writing podcast special offer, get two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership with code RW podcast. That's code RW podcast for two audiobooks for the price of one for your first month of membership at Libro.fm. Well, welcome back to the reading and writing podcast. My guest today is Nate patron author of the new book, bring that beat back how sampling built hip hop. Nate, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on. Sure. Well, the subtitle of your new book is How Sampling Built Hip Hop. So in um, a short uh, explanation, how did sampling exactly build hip hop? Well, hip hop started out as a DJ driven genre. There were rappers whose uh, job it was largely to you know, hype the crowd up and uh, and also uh, give props to the DJ himself. Uh, but for the most part, it was a uh, it was a phenomenon where it was largely a uh, you know guy with uh, two turntables and uh, had uh, sort of like the kind of like the run of the dance floor. He selected the uh, you know the the tracks to spin and uh, cut between them, and uh, the kind of pioneering technique uh, developed by Cool Herc uh, was to pick specific breaks. Uh, which were drum breaks in the middle of the record uh, and kind of like loop them from one record to the other. He'd have two copies of the same record and he'd kind of like cross fade between them. So he could take the instrumental drum break of a song that people really like to dance to and then just keep it going for as long as he wanted. And so he would do, like, he would do that by going back and forth between the, the two records. So, so he could keep the, the drum break going. Yeah, that was like the the prototype for sampling. Uh, there were other, like before actual digital samplers were available, there were other techniques that uh, DJs and producers like to use. Uh, one of the popular techniques, uh, although it was very uh, time intensive and required a lot of finesse, was the beat tape, uh, or the pause tape, actually it's called, uh, where you would actually take a tape deck that was hooked up to a stereo and record a piece of music, you know, usually a, usually a vinyl record. And you'd record that same break. And then you'd pause the tape, bring the needle back to the beginning of the break, play it again and record it. And so you'd have like a, like a, like a tape loop that you did manually. So what are your earliest memories of discovering hip hop yourself? Well, I was, uh, I was born in the late seventies. So by the time I was starting to pay attention to music, hip hop was already part of the, uh, uh, part of the, uh, general, uh, assemblage of things you could see on, uh, on MTV. Um, and actually before that, uh, because I know, uh, one of my earlier memories of it, uh, was going to a, uh, going to the movies and seeing the movie beat street with my family. Uh, my brother was also, uh, getting super into hip hop around the, around the mid eighties. I think that was like, like circa 84 was when, uh, like break dancing hit mid America. And so we were all re- like really psyched to see this, you know, fascinating, uh, scene coming out of, you know, all the way out of New York. And, uh, like we lived in the twin cities. So, uh, 
so it was kind of like we were, it wasn't like a small town or anything, but well, like our big music scene was like, oh yeah, Prince and Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and such. So hip hop was not necessarily an unfamiliar uh, milieu, so to speak, you know, cause it, it, you know, we got the kind of impression that it was like similar to along the kind of like the same lines as funk because it was around that time. It was largely, uh, it was like, you know, turntablism and scratching, but like a lot of the production was done with the same drum machines that, you know, that uh, some of the funk producers at the time used. And so that was, that was kind of like the inroads to that. And eventually, uh, like the, the door was pretty much finally kicked down by run DMC. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people my age, especially like a lot of people outside of New York, you know, a lot of white kids, a lot of, a lot of other kids were like suddenly like, well, Run DMC were like the biggest hip hop group in the world at the time. I mean, uh, like the Beastie Boys came shortly afterwards, but Raising Hell sold more albums than any hip hop record uh, to date at that point. Like Run DMC were like the first hip hop group to, you know, go, go gold. And then I think go platinum and uh, with an LP uh, and by that point, it's like, okay, well, what else is there out there that sounds like this? And uh, that that pretty much opened the floodgates. Well, unlike some art forms, rap historians and aficionados can trace hip-hop back to early parties in the Bronx in the 1970s. Can you talk about those early days? Yeah, uh, it's a very specific uh, date and time. It was uh, uh, August 1973. Uh, because Cool Herc, the uh, the uh, DJ who popularized hip hop, and I would I would credit with largely inventing it, uh, was the uh, was the guy who started it. And this was a kind of a sort of a micro generation gap in music at the time, because and also a a kind of a class gap and a you know gap between the boroughs, because like DJing was already a thing in the, you know, in the, in the early seventies. And you had a, you know, a variety of different styles of DJs. You had like the, the parties at the loft and you had uh, guys like uh, Grandmaster Flowers, who was one of the acknowledged influences on early hip hop, who'd like DJ at, you know, James Brown concerts and such. But the, th- the thing about hip hop was, is that it was a product of the Bronx and most DJs and clubs at the time were situated in Manhattan or, or elsewhere. And they catered to a somewhat older clientele than the, uh, than the younger hip hop fans, uh, that were generally like not allowed in the club because they were too young or because, you know, they were, you know, sneakers and track suits instead of, you know, fancy outfits. And there was that sort of, yeah, that, that's that sort of class gap, that age gap. And also there is uh, it's kind of a well-documented thing that hip hop was kind of a uh, like once uh, like gangs in the Bronx started kind of scattering and winding down they were, they were still around, you know, in the late 70s. Uh, if you watch uh, the documentary 80 Blocks from Tiffany's, you'll get a pretty good uh, good view of that. But a lot of kids were like, you know, just tired of gang stuff and wanted to find different outlets for their kind of like, uh, uh, I'd say like, yeah, restlessness. And so they, instead of like just going out and beating each other up and stabbing each other, they were like, well, let's battle another way. Let's battle for style. And that's, you know, uh, and like the form of dancing, which was uh, eventually called b-boying for, you know, the B for breaks, uh, they would, uh, you know, they get into these battles where they'd kind of develop these styles of dance that looks some like <laughs> they're like, they're like, yeah, the, the James Brown or Soul Train routines, you know, turned up to 11. It was very, very young, very energetic, very, uh, like very competitive, but at the end of the day, it was also just extremely, you know, creative and influential to the point where like 10 years later you had break dancers in McDonald's commercials. It was, it was a remarkable scene. Sure. Um, well, you, you talked about these early parties in the Bronx and, and how they were looping and creating this new 
um, basically musical art form, um, a lot of times based out of just ingenuity and, and trying to figure this stuff out um, with the tools that they had at hand. Um, what, uh, as someone who has studied the, the hip hop genre and, and art form, uh, what was the first hip hop song that charted on the Billboard charts? And did that contain a sample? Well, that's a kind of a tricky question, actually, because the first, like the first song that is acknowledged to have what we recognize as rap on it, actually varies. Uh, before "Rapper's Delight" by the Sugar Hill Gang, which is the famous, like first actual charting hit, uh, the group Fatback Band, uh, who I believe were also out of New York, had a track the same year, 1979, uh, called "King Tim the Third, which had the titular uh, MC actually rapping on it. Um, but yeah, Rapper's Delight is generally considered the first. Uh, the catch to that is uh, they didn't use sampling or a DJ, really. They had uh, the record label uh, assembled a studio band and had them kind of simulate or replay a loop of Sheik's Good Times, uh, which eventually got them into some uh, uh, attribution trouble with uh, Sheik, but uh, that was when uh, the early standard was set. But if you ask me, the first actual example of uh, hip-hop as a single, uh, and it was a, it was a minor chart hit, but it was, uh, it was very much a breakthrough, was The Adventures of Grandmaster Flash on the Wheels of Steel, because that was an actual DJ routine. And it took a few years for people to actually get used to the idea of, you know, who would want to hear hip hop on a record? It's a live phenomenon. And you have like, you know, you have these live DJ routines and you have, you know, call and responses to the audience. Why would you want to you know buy a record of a record? But uh, Flash basically broke through by convincing Sugar Hill to record a routine he'd come up with uh, that was... Uh, it took a few tries, but he was able to record it uh, uh, front to back as a as a um, unedited performance, and it was a very kind of like a remarkable routine in that he would, in this case, uh, it was like a it was sort of like an act of DJing as both like taste making and criticism because he took uh, elements of rappers' delight and. Sheik's Good Times, which it had uh, interpolated. And then he also mixed it in with uh, Queen's Another One Bites the Dust, which was a direct sort of lift of the uh, kind of bass guitar interplay that Sheik did. So there is like this sort of blend of like keeping a consistent sound going like, you know, like a DJ would, but also juxtaposing these different songs and like letting listeners draw the connections and draw the conclusions. And then of course there was, you know, all the different cutting and scratching routines he did that really caught people's attention because that, uh, you know, scratching, which he developed sort of parallel with, uh, his friend grand wizard Theodore was the big, uh, attention getting element of hip hop that would carry on through, you know, much of the, uh, much of the next couple decades. So your book focuses on four hip hop uh, musicians, uh, Grandmaster Flash, Prince Paul, Dr. Dre, and Mad Lib. Can you explain why you focus the book on these four? Uh, yeah, I wanted to tell kind of a broad story of hip hop while, uh, still allowing to, let some of the more personal stories and individual highlights really shine through. And I picked these four artists because they were both very, very influential and also very well connected and, you know, central to very, you know, uh, interconnected scenes. Uh, Flash is, I would say, like, well, he's the first like household name DJ. He's the first, real superstar DJ. And he was there uh, pretty much along with, uh, you know, Cool Herc and Africa Bambata as the, like they're considered the founding fathers of hip hop. And Flash was the one who is uh, 
really able to kind of uh, get the jump on getting his uh, name out there fairly early and becoming kind of like the, the one big celebrity out of the hip hop scene. Uh, and then uh, Prince Paul, I picked because he is right in the center of when actual sampling like digital, like uh, like digital and drum machine sampling started to become the norm in hip hop in the mid late eighties. And it's a lot of the albums he produced, particularly the ones he did with uh, De La Soul, their first three albums uh, are some of the most remarkable examples of, uh, of, of sampling uh, uh, to date, I'd say. And he also got around, he had a lot of associations with a lot of the other major creative types in hip hop, whether it was the, uh, whether it was the Native Tongues crew, which included a tribe called Quest, Jungle Brothers, Queen Latifah, um, and then later on, I mean, he 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 and the RZA of the Wu Tang Clan also went way back, and they both collaborated uh, on a on a beat tape or on a uh, on kind of like a conceptual tape that they started putting together before the Wu Tang Clan even came out. Is this, this group, the Grave Diggers, that uh, that eventually hit the market? like in the wake of the Wu-Tang Clan, it became a sort of phenomenon unto itself. Uh, Dr. Dre I picked because he's li- like not just the godfather of West Coast hip hop and G-Funk and literally defined the style of an entire region and an entire coast. He's also, I mean, he's the superstar producer. Uh, in, in a way, he actually uh, kind of... Uh, kind of predicted a lot of the uh issues that would come around with uh with uh the uh, nature of sampling as to whether you wanted to keep uh whether a producer wanted to keep uh focusing on uh you know sampling and lifting elements of other artists music between creating your own sort of sonic universe with with your own riffs and your own compositions. He really blurred the lines between those. And then Mad Lib is, and he's, uh, who is really still like, he's been out at it for like, yeah, since the mid nineties, he's this very diligent, long running lifer of a producer who is largely well known. I mean, he's done beats for people as, you know, well known as Kanye West, but he's largely a kind of an underground producer who really loves to experiment and loves really dredging up the strangest things he can to make beats out of. And he's something of a sort of a preservationist and a crate digger and a guy who really defines himself by the fact that he really believes in the you know, the art of sampling as a way to connect with the source material he, he, he creates or he, or the source material he samples. Well, do you have favorite samples that have been used in multiple hip hop songs? Oh, wow. I think, well, I, I have quite a few, but I think the champion of them all has to be the incredible bongo bands, Apache. Uh, it has been, you know, presence basically from the beginning to this year uh it was part of uh cool herc's early routines it was uh featured in the third volume of the uh ultimate breaks and beats compilation which was the uh long-running series in the mid 80s that really kick-started and you know well really boosted the idea of uh of crate digging sample culture in uh, in the mid 80s and uh and it's been like the backbone of all sorts of, you know, you, you pick a year or at least pick a decade and you'll figure, oh yeah, one of the greatest hip hop tracks of all time use this, you know, whether it's Nas's made you look or, uh, or man, it, it, it extends beyond hip hop actually to like drum and bass and, and, uh, you know, techno in that it was very widely used in such a way that it's, instantly recognizable, even if you don't know what the song uh, that being sampled actually is. So as you mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned Prince Paul um, mm-hmm. earlier, uh, and you mentioned that he worked uh, with De La Soul and produced their landmark album, Three Feet High and Rising. 
That album is a classic, but it also resulted in a huge legal fight with the Turtles over sampling their song, You Showed Me. Why do you think record labels and artists and musicians couldn't reach an agreement about sampling uh, with a rap artist? Is it just purely greed? I think it's a mixture of things. And I mean, some artists were fine with it. Some artists weren't. I mean, Lonnie Liston Smith, for instance, when he heard uh, Stetson Sonic uh, using his uh, using the bass riff from his song Expansions for uh, talking all that jazz, he's like, yeah, you did something new with this. I like it. You can have it. Uh, but the like the Turtles, for instance, that was a funny case in that like, oh, it, like Prince Paul didn't loop like the suit was brought by Flo and Eddie, the singers of the group. Prince Paul didn't loop their voices. He didn't loop any of the, you know, instruments they were playing. If they even played any instruments and they didn't even write the song. It's a new year. And with T-Mobile, it's not about how far apart we are. It's about how close we can be. So we're bringing out our best deal right now. Get the iPhone 12 on us on every single plan with eligible iPhone trade-in. So I can FaceTime with my sister in Savannah. That's right. The iPhone 12 on us on every plan. All on America's 5G leader in coverage. T-Mobile. With 24 monthly bill credits and a new line plus tax. If you cancel credit, stop and balance on required finance agreement may be due. Contact us for well-qualified buyers. Qualifying consumer plan required. See coverage and offer details at T-Mobile.com. It takes thousands of hours to become an astronaut. Right, Nina? Oh, I'm not an astronaut. I'm a design consultant at the Container Store. But you explore space. I help you find space with our Alpha Closet systems. And you're an expert. Pretty good at it. And you use satellites to communicate. I'm doing more virtual in-home closet designs, but I wouldn't say... We salute you, astronaut Nina, for helping us find space. You're welcome. The Alpha sales bonus is here. Earn up to $500 in credit now through February 7th at the Container Store, where space comes from. It was written by, uh, I, I think it was uh, Roger McGuinn, or, or uh, at least co-written by a couple members of, of the Birds. So they were suing De La for manipulating a song that they, you know, an element of a song that they didn't really have very much creative input into in the first place. So it was kind of an ironic uh, attempt to reclaim, uh, you know, something that is kind of, you know you know, used it differently in a creative license. But uh, yeah, in some cases, there are all sorts of reasons that, uh, that musicians don't want to have their stuff sampled. Uh, sometimes it's just a creative disagreement where it's like, I don't want to have this, you know, this jazz instrumental I wrote used in a song that's all about, you know, explicit sex or what have you. Uh, or sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's just a matter of, uh, just not being into it. But, you know, sometimes you have people who are well, like George Clinton, like he was fine with being sampled. His beef was with his record company and his publishing because they weren't, you know, forwarding him the money that he'd get from it. Right. So, so given your, your writing the book and your knowledge about um, hip hop and specifically sampling, uh, and, you know, I don't think you're a lawyer, but can you explain where the legal lines are? Because isn't there, um, isn't there concepts and, and I, I don't have the specific term in front of me, but isn't there, um, well, there's fair use, but isn't there, uh, legal, uh, issues around transformative, uh, of art where you take a piece of art and transform it, um, where does that where does that line fall in terms of rap artists using clips or samples from another song? Well, I mean, I think it's a side effect of the music business itself. I mean, you didn't like did Andy Warhol even get sued by Campbell Soup for for doing his uh, screen prints? And you know, I never heard about that. But when you have like so much money at stake, because we're talking about like the record industry in the eighties and nineties and early two thousands where money was just everywhere. And, you know, there was so much money to be made and, you know, going, you know, going platinum was just the start. I think when you have issues of sample clearance and, uh, and, uh, fair use and other things that, uh, have some basis in artistic merit, 
the record companies will still focus primarily on, okay, well, who's getting paid and who's getting not, and how can we make this work? And that's why sample clearance got prohibitively expensive in the 90s to the point where you had kind of like this bifurcation uh, where you had huge mainstream producers like Dr. Dre or Puff Daddy who could you know, afford to sample any big pop hit they wanted. And then on the other hand, you had underground producers like Mad Lib or, um, or like LP or DJ Shadow who would basically have to go super obscure to create whatever they wanted and, you know, basically just hold out hope that uh, nobody knew who published something, uh, you know, or, uh, that the person who recorded this extremely obscure one-off seven inch wouldn't come calling with a lawyer. So it's, it's a very, I think it's a very combative and complicated situation that recently I think has started to kind of lighten up. I think that the artist concerns nowadays are that sampling is at least a way to get further exposure and that the real problems getting paid are from, you know, like paltry streaming revenue. And also now the problem of not being able to tour because of the, because of the pandemic. So like, yeah, nowadays sampling just seems to, you know, come with the turf and I'm sure there is still like very expensive clearances and such, but at the same time, you don't have like these, uh, generations of artists like there were in the eighties who were like, why did you take my music and do something different with it? And, you know, like they're, 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 they're usually a lot, you know, a lot more magnanimous about it now. Right. Well, you've mentioned Dr. Dre uh, uh, earlier. How was Dre different uh, on his first songs and albums from what others were producing and sampling at the time? Honestly, he wasn't that different. Like if you listen to, well, if you listen to uh, like straight out of Compton, there's, you hear a lot of the similar kinds of production techniques and styles that you'd hear on a public enemy record or an EPMD record from around that time. What the big difference was initially was his background because in Los Angeles, uh, the big thing, I mean, hip hop was, you know, around, but the real popular stuff was electro. And, uh, you had groups like, you know, like posses and DJ uh, sets like uncle jams army who were really like putting on these shows that are, uh, you know, co-signing artists like, you know, Egyptian lover and Arabian Prince who did these like real up-tempo, uh, you know, real drum machine style, like, like kind of like it sounded a, you know, a bit more like a fair amount more like techno than hip hop straight up. Uh, Dr. Dre was, you know, part of that scene. Uh, but he was also well-versed with like DJing house parties and stuff. And one of his secret weapons was, when things started like getting tense or when like a couple of, you know, gangsters started fighting at a party or something, he would put on like zaps more bounce to the ounce or something by Parliament Funkadelic and everybody would stop fighting and just dance. They would go wild. And so he like really picked up on that sort of like West coast sense of like electro funk, that more down tempo, slow writing kind of groove. And he'd start really like, putting that to the foreground. Like for instance, uh, there is uh, like one of his characteristic uh, sounds is the mini Moog, which he first uh, really let fly on uh, NWA's track dope man. There is this uh, song by the Ohio players called funky worm, which is actually a fairly big R and B hit back in the uh, early seventies that has this very sinuous kind of almost exotic uh, mini Moog synthesizer line that he into that Dre integrated into dope man and, and really, really made it stand out. And that's how, uh, things really started to kind of take off for what he called G funk. And that eventually, uh, peaked in 92, 93 with the releases of, uh, the chronic and Snoop Dogg's doggy style. Those were when he really nailed in what, West coast hip hop was going to sound like. And there were other artists too, like, especially like, you know, down in, uh, down in, uh, or up in Oakland, like too short, 
uh, was a very, uh, very influential too. But I think in particular, the really like synthesizer heavy funk was what put uh, Dr. Dre on the map. Well, in your book, you write about Mad Villainy, the Mad Lib Doom collaboration from 2004. What was the importance uh, to you of Mad Villainy? That is a very, very remarkable record to me because it's, well, first off, it kind of continued the resurrection of an MC who had basically been thrown away by the industry. I mean, MF Doom started out as Zev Love X. Uh, He actually debuted on a third bass song, The Gas Face, which is produced by Prince Paul. And then uh, he had this group KMD that were, you know, starting to really come up there. They sounded kind of like a, kind of like the cousins of a tribe called Quest in a way. Uh, But they got in a lot of, you know, trouble with their label for their second album because they wanted to call it Black Bastards and drew a, uh, uh, like a logo of a uh, kind of like a racist caricature being hung. And they, like they explained that, oh, this is like, we're, we're killing the caricature and we're bringing you the realness. But, uh, you know, a few columnists got wind of the album art concept and were not happy with it. And eventually, you know, their label uh, dropped them. And around the same, like around the same time, uh, Sub Rock, one of the uh, MCs in the group and, you know, MF Doom's brother or Zev Love X's brother uh, was killed uh, in a pedestrian accident. And so Zev Love X went underground for a few years to try to kind of uh, figure out what to do with the rest of his life. And eventually started emceeing again under this guise of MF doom, you know, this, this kind of, uh, emotionally twisted villain behind a mask. And he released a, uh, a few albums in the late nineties, early aughts that really started to uh, give him a lot of underground cred and a lot of love, uh, like operation doomsday, which is, a real, real fantastic record. Um, and then in the meantime, I think, uh, I mean, like Madlib knew about him at the time. And so they eventually wanted to do some sort of collaboration. And like when they finally met up, everything just clicked. And it was a very f- interesting kind of recording process because they were almost never in the same room, but they vibed almost like artistically just by exchanging ideas because doom would write some lyrics. He, you know, send them down to uh, Madlib, who's working in his you know, studio downstairs. Uh, he'd uh, come up with a beat. He'd bring the beat to uh, MF doom. Doom would write more lyrics for the beat and it'd go back and forth. They're communicating artistically without even necessarily being in the same room. And the end result was a very, It was like, well, it dropped at a time when mainstream hip hop was very glossy and very, you know, very high stakes, very, you know, very kind of self-serious. I mean, like 50 Cent was like the biggest artist in the world at that point. And like Mad Villainy was super grimy. I mean, it feels like, you know, if you found a copy in the store and you pick it up, you know, you expect to come up, you know, come out with it, you know come on, like find nicotine stains on your fingers, but it's a, you know, it, it's an album that really felt lived in and like it had always been there and it was not afraid to be extremely weird. I mean, this is an album that, uh, sampled, uh, and I mentioned this in the intro, it's, uh, sampled Steve Reich, uh, 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 his, uh, tape loop, uh, of a, uh, of a uh, young black man in the 1960s who had been testifying about uh, like a police brutality uh, situation uh, he'd suffered through uh, Mad Lib kind of like took one of those. Yeah. Like one of the earliest examples of tape manipulation music and turned that into a beat or like used it in his beat. And you know, he'd also, sample just very counterintuitive things like uh there's this track uh called accordion which is just a very odd kind of off-kilter accordion loop uh provided you know from a song 
by Daedalus, who's um, kind of like a peer of Mad Libs in Los Angeles kind of underground abstract beat scene. And you'd have so many different ideas on this record that seemed like completely foreign to people who were like largely just paying attention to mainstream or uh, just straight up, uh, you know, just straight up plain hip hop that that really broke through and sort of informed a sense of like what sort of countercultural beat driven music would sound like for the next decade or so because after you know mad lib you'd have uh, a lot of the scene coming up in los angeles with you know the likes of like like flying lotus and then like eventually like thundercat uh and it's it's just all very it, it just seems very pivotal a record when it comes to uh, um, kind of like inspiring people by breaking the rules. Sure. Well, the use of samples have changed over time as well as the production tools. As you mentioned earlier, when hip hop started, you had two turntables and and a microphone and and, uh, experimenting with loops as well. Now a kid in his basement can grab samples and stems and use GarageBand or Audacity to create a mashup. Do you think that wider access to audio tools will lead to even more creativity and hip hop in the years ahead? I think so. I mean, we still have producers, you know, young producers, especially who really love putting together sample based beats. There's a whole genre uh, on YouTube, you know, the low high lo fi hip hop beats to study and chill to, which kind of takes its cues uh, in a lot of respects from, for instance, uh, well, like the music of Jay Dilla, who is a, uh, a Mad Lib collaborator and one of the most well-respected and creative uh, hip-hop producers of all time, who sadly passed in 2006. Um, but he's uh, really had this kind of like lingering influence uh, on pretty much everyone who'd heard him. Uh, so, you, and you still have, it, the, the, the funny thing is, is, a lot of the, uh, I mean, it's it seems very cross generational nowadays because you have uh, young people who can just go to uh, YouTube, find any weird obscure song they want, and do something with it. Well, in the meantime, you also have some of these you know older school producers who came up in like the you know eighties and nineties who are still making you know these uh, these. Uh, really great records that are somewhere between like they, they're somewhere between cult hit and, and renowned hit. It's, it's a very, things feel very up in the air and up for grabs right now, but there are so many possibilities and so many options. And I think once we really start to get a kind of uh emergent scene happening, whether it's, whether it's an internet scene or, uh, just another collective of of artists who are you know centered around a particular neighborhood or a particular city. I think we're going to just keep on seeing new ideas and new things. And uh, there's always going to be new music, so there's always going to be new music to sample. Sure. So, what hip hop musicians have you particularly loved and enjoyed in the past couple of years? Oh wow! Um, I know, like one of the big ones, like is Run the Jewels, who. I, I find it remarkable in that they're like, you know, LP and killer Mike are a couple of lifers. You know, they both emerged uh, around like late nineties, early aughts and were both doing their own thing. And then they just teamed up to collaborate for, uh, for an album uh, for killer Mike's album, RAP music. And they realized, well, we have this rapport. We sound good together. Let's just keep going. And so you have like, you know, a couple of 40 something dudes, who are making some of the hottest music out there right now, which is pretty uh, remarkable. Um, there's also, oh man, um, there is this, uh, there's this uh, MC producer out of Brownsville, Brooklyn, uh, Ka, who's who's also kind of an older head, uh, K A. That's that's his name, Ka, and he like has this very remarkable way of juxtaposing his voice, which is a generally like kind of like quiet intensity, sort of like true, 
like true crime neo noir sort of vibe, and the beats he puts out are kind of almost ambient in that he tends to like really loop melodies more than he puts beats to the foreground. I mean, like a lot of his tracks, basically all you hear is like, you know, for percussion is like a snare. And then everything else is carried by this, you know, melody that comes from some, uh, you know, obscure jazz track or, you know, even prog rock. He's got a very remarkable sort of sense of how to build atmosphere without actually relying specifically on, uh, um, you know, traditional percussive drive, and you can still kind of fill in the blanks when it comes to the cadence and the beat in your head. Anyone else? Oh, let's see. Um, I think, man, uh, there is, you know, there's Alchemist. He's been around for a while too. Um, he's done a lot of, uh, uh, collaborations with both, you know, s- like super famous uh, artists and obscure up and comers. Like he's, you know, re- you know, done beats for like Eminem and you know members of Three Six Mafia, and he's also, you know, put out like he's also kind of like mentored some younger uh, MCs and rappers, and he also has this sense. He's he's very similar to Madlib in that he really likes to kind of like delve into odd kind of in, like almost travelogue like uh music uh like he's recorded series of uh of kind of beat tapes and mix albums that uh, originate from like oh here's a bunch of albums i got from the you know like rock albums and jazz albums and orchestral albums from the you know 1970s soviet union or you know, I went to Israel and I came back with a bunch of, you know, folk rock records that I'm going to make into beats or, you know, here's a bunch of, you know, French, uh, art rock that I'm going to do, you know, some things with. So like you get these guys who are very conceptual and very, uh, very eclectic, but they can still put their own, put their own thumbprint on things. So where can people find you online to learn more about you and your book? I'm on Twitter at uh, at Nate Patron. That's N A T E P A T R I N. I post quite a lot about music. Uh, I uh, will, uh, you know, if you uh, if you like hip hop or if you like the you know out there stuff at samples, give me a look. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Nate Patron, author of the new book "Bring That Beat Back: How Sampling Built Hip Hop." Go buy a copy of the book now. And Nate, thanks for doing this interview. Hey, thanks for having me again. Great. Fifteen minutes could save you fifteen percent or more. Is that Shakespeare? Nope, it's Geico. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Shakespeare from one of his unpublished works. Oh, it be not for awakening. Nay, give it thou the berries. For 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. No, it's from Geico, because they help save people money. Well, I hate to break it to you, but Geico got it from Shakespeare. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more.